heavy. Bored. And the thing about it too, like this book, like I think what people forget about the emo culture or what they like don't choose not to remember about it is that like it's actually incredibly romantic, right? Like the culture itself and like the lyrics and even the poems in this, like, like, uh, one of my questions that I wanted to ask you, like, are these love poems? Like, and it's like specifically like an emo style of love poem, which I think people underestimate how like tender some of that emo stuff was like, yeah, it was kind of like whiny, you know, cut my wrist, black my eyes type shit. But like, it was still like, there's like a tenderness or like a romantic kind of yearning underneath of it all. I yeah, no, I absolutely think that these are love poems, but they're like dark love poems, which is why, you know, that relates because it's like they're riddled with like self-loathing, but also interspersed with romance. And there's like body horror. Like you've kind of got all of these elements coexisting together. And, you know, there's like all these repeated themes, repetition throughout the collection of like words and images and stuff like that, that, yeah, no, like I, I can see why there's even something like musical about it, but yeah, no, there's like a certain darkness to the, to the yearning and to the romance. Like, it's like, you know, that almost like this sensation that like, you're never going to actually get what you want which I think is very archetypal in like that emo genre as well. It's like, it's a really romantic sense of it too. Like the kind of going for something, you know, you'll never get kind of, and then constantly doing it. Well, say it again. Sorry. Sorry. No, like, or something that's going to hurt you. Like you want it, but you know, it's bad for you. Like, I think that that is very definitive of that genre. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And I think it's also like this aspect of like, and I think emo is tied up in this too, that like, these are confessional right? Like, these are like in the vein of the confessional greats from like the 60s. And we'll get into that a little bit because Glick brings it up. And I'm going to ask Cassandra about it. But like, I was just like, there is something emo about the kind of confessional aspect. And Glick brings it up to like Plath and stuff like that in the I haven't marked here. I'll, I'll fucking find it. I know I've made so many notes, but they're all like in the book. So I'm just like flipping through the book like, ah, <laughs> this is on uh, page 10 of the intro, uh, a little bit of a paragraph. I'll read this and then we'll chat. It's uh, for a book like uh, this is Luis Glick. And I want to say Cassandra and I want to talk about Luis Glick, too. It's not an accident that Luis Glick picked this book at this time in 2004. And like what she calls panic in this thing is kind of like in the emo ethos, the kind of anxiety as personality trend that kind of captured all this. But like that's part of confessional too. Like you're kind of oversharing to a certain extent. Like that was part of the culture, right? Especially about like love interests or whatever. So uh, for a book like this to work, it cannot deviate from obsession, lest its urgency in being occasional seem unconvincing. Books of this kind dream big, they trust not only what drives them, but the importance of what drives them. When they work, as Plath's Ariel works, they are unforgettable. They restore to poetry that sense of crucial moment and crucial utterance, which may indeed be the great genius of the form. But the problems of such undertakings are immense. Plath's thousand imitators cannot sustain her intensity or her, resource, or her resourcefulness. And I just want to say, like, I think it's fitting that Glick brings up Plath in this sense, but I want to know what you thought about in terms of like connecting this to the larger confessional movement, you know, Plath being like the most famous confessional poet probably that ever lived. Yeah, totally. I can see parallels with her. I can see parallels with, you know, Anne Sexton and kind of everyone in that movement. Oh, yeah. Um, like, I don't know, when I got into Psychon for the first time, I was very much a confessional poet if I could even call myself at the time a poet I was like 19 years old or whatever and I was just oversharing on the internet and writing my shitty little confessional poetry but that's why this spoke to me so much because there was like he just had such a way of kind of conveying these like deep dark ugly feelings but ma making them beautiful and he's very aware of himself throughout the collection as him being the narrator, as him being the writer, as him being like both a reliable and an unreliable narrator, like on not to like get ahead. Resources, American resources. Being bored? You know, some activities are intentional, right? 
It shows such a lack of gratitude for life. Forward. I, I aspire to boredom, I should say. Forward. I am heavy, heavy, heavy. Forward. Has your night sweats and the day sweats, pal? Pal, I do.